Okay. Well, thanks for, for joining us, everybody. Um, we're still on Zoom, but the uh, the reason why I wanted to, I chose sort of the value the top the topic really the value of human connection because I think it's something that we've all missed so much and um, especially myself actually and and when um, Joe and John were sort of we were sort of brainstorming I I felt that this was kind of quite topical I've I've personally just come back from a trip to um, Dubai in the Middle East where I've had a lot more human connection than I've had in the past year for sure and I it really um, resonated with me that the actual importance of being in person um, and Zoom has been a great replacement but um, there is nothing like having a hug and as Simon will know I love a hug um, I'm quite a tactile person by nature and actually now it's quite difficult to work out how you um, how you greet someone and so I think that's um, will be part of the conversation we have today so I'd like to um, you know the simple the simple act of hugging was taken away from us and um, I don't think any of us really realized how much the pandemic and um, would change our lives. Um, so for me, it's quite important now that, you know, how we we transition back into in-person um, events and how we navigate our way around um, whether we have, you know, whether we ever go back to normal or whether we will have a hybrid now going back um, as we go back into the workplace. And actually, I think the Prime Minister today has had to, um, be called to account on whether we now have to go back to having mandatory masks, et cetera, because the numbers are going up. So it's it's a it's a it's an ever changing um, situation that we're probably going to face face for for some time. So how do we navigate human connection and what's the importance of it? And have we did we miss under undervalue it perhaps because um, it was taken away from us and it was something that actually money couldn't buy. Um, so I'd love to introduce you to the two lovely men that are going to join me in this conversation, um, Simon Berger and Johnny Jacobs. Some of you I'm sure will be very familiar with, with both of their faces. Um, so I'm going to hand it to Simon to give me a short introduction before Johnny will do the same and then we will begin the conversation. So Simon, Thanks, come Thanks. on. Thank you very much. Um, I never normally go in front or before Johnny, um, you know, Johnny, because uh, he's far more important than I am. Um, but look, lovely to be here today. Um, I, my sort of background is uh, live events. So the topic today couldn't be more close to my heart. Uh, I've been doing events for 30 years um, and the Mad World Make a Difference Summit for the last four or five years. And the importance of um, physical interaction has been paramount in my life. I've hated the last 18 months in terms of these virtual events and Zoom calls. Um, and I'm absolutely desperate to, to get back to physical events. I'm delighted to say we've already done two this month, you know, comedy festival with Uber. Um, we did a big literary festival with uh, Netflix earlier in, in this month and last month. And of course, we have the Mad World Summit tomorrow, which I'm actually in the venue building up now and interacting with all the contractors and the and the, the different um, stakeholders and putting on an event. So um, looking forward to talking. Tell me a little bit about, about you, Simon, your sort of background and how you have come to be a master of curating such events as the, the one tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure there's any real science to it other than the fact that we've been doing it a long time. Our place in the food chain is we we spot great events in sort of like we're industry agnostic, but we spot great events wherever they might be being staged in the world. Um, and then we um, replicate them, um, plagiarise maybe, but hopefully do them better, uh, more innovatively and disruptively. Um, we add uh, festival festivalization and expiration um, and experiential activations as a part of everything we do. Um, and the secret for us is, is community and ensuring that whatever sector you're in, and as I say, we do a lot of different business sectors that um, you're delivering what the visitor wants um, and then they will keep coming back. So yeah, our place in the food chain is we launch shows, we run them for a series um, um, and then we sort of like partner up or exit to the big exhibition organizers. And we've been doing that for, as I say, over 30 years now. 
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this. And and over to you, Johnny. Tell me about yourself and and um, why why you are here. Thank you, Laura. And uh, Simon, you're too kind. I'll be uh, coming straight to give you a hug tomorrow. That's for sure. Hugs all round for everybody. Um, why am I here? So I'm um, Johnny, uh, finance director at Starbucks. Um, my background, obviously, is in finance, working with big brands. Um, but I guess as well as uh, loving coffee and numbers, um, I'm also really passionate about mental health and well-being. And you're probably wondering why do you have a finance person sat here talking about it? Um, we're not necessarily known for talking about our emotions. Um, you know, for, for me, I had quite a troubling childhood, uh, probably not with a huge amount of human connection, actually. Um, and I just feel quite privileged, I guess, to even be here today and be able to influence. And I work with various businesses and organizations to try and further the mental health and well-being agenda, particularly in, in business. Um, and as part of that, I'm a trustee of the Mental Health Foundation, which is one of the UK's leading charities for mental health, uh, and also sit on the board of a few other um, mental health organisations. Um, and at the moment, we're actually working with uh, an exciting group, the Institute of Accountants, um, on our mental fitness and business plan as well, really trying to make some change in, in this world, really. Perfect. Thank you. And actually, that's, that's that's something that I'd wanted to pick up on. The accountants, I guess, would have a bit of a bad press. I would have thought they, I, I, I use this word, it's not to be offensive, but would have come across as being emotionally constipated, I guess. So perhaps it's, perhaps it's a great, it's a great place for you to be to um, get rid of that stigma, but also to educate and to get people to talk a little bit more about their feelings in perhaps an industry that would generally or, you know, historically not be very talkative about their feelings. Yeah, I guess um, I was probably one of those uh, constipated people, actually. Many uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe I'm slightly ignorant. Matt's many, just chipped many. in on the chat and said he's an accountant and he's definitely not a racial. <laughs> 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 maybe it's my fault. I've totally got the wrong, I've been engaging with the wrong accountants. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, th I think it's a very um, fair generalisation and we're not, you know, we're not a bunch known for using our emotional side of our brains. We're much more logical and you know, it's something I've been on a journey on. It's probably only in the last sort of 10 years, really, I've started to really focus a lot more on my, you know, emotions, relationships, emotional intelligence. Because um, I don't necessarily think we get taught that, really. We just get taught to, you know, work with clients and deliver on numbers, really. So I think, so. I think it's a fair point. And there's loads of opportunity um, which we can get into. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's um, let's begin. So, Simon, um, tomorrow and jo and Johnny, I will be seeing you both in person for a hug, so that will be nice. But tell me, what have you uh, missed the most this year? I think when we had a brief chat before, you said that if Zoom continued, virtual events continued, you'd have thrown it all up in the air and and gone and ride some more horses in Portugal. Yeah, I mean. It Categorically. Um, so for me, as I say, I've, I've been in the business for a long time, but it's live events. I'm not, you know, I, ironically, up until the pandemic hit, we all talked about sort of like virtual events and hybrid events and um, and everyone's, you know, it's for those that couldn't travel to an event. And it was a good idea, but it was done very, very poorly. And I suppose if you're looking at advancements or things to look at, which have been good at this, then this sort of virtual hybrid Zoom like we're on now, you know, has advanced massively and it actually probably as exhibition organisers, it showed us up that we hadn't, uh, you know, really got the tech or the ability to do it before, and now we have. Um, however, from the, the, the adverse, or, you know, the flip side of that for me is that, you know, people were talking about the new normal. Well, the new normal, you know, is the old normal. You know, yeah. people are people. They need to interact. They need to be with each other. You know, I, I mean, from my point of view, I, I, there's no way on earth I could forge... Um, a long lasting relationship business or otherwise, you know, unless I've met someone um, and, you know, and I genuinely feel that is still the case. So I'm immensely excited that we're all coming back to it. And, um, you know, I just, 
I genuinely feel that without that human interaction, um, and sometimes it's subliminal. I mean, that, that we're all looking at each other now on a, uh, you know, yeah. it's quite tiring as we'll all, we've all found it. We've even termed this fatigue thing. But, mm. you know, you're still looking at each other the whole time. When you're with each other, um, you know, someone might look away or do up their shoelace or go and grab a coffee and you'll be, you, the other person or people will be looking at mannerisms and, uh, and that's, all about relationships and that smile or that twinkle or as you as you know Laura, i don't want to embarrass you but you know you're very very tactile um which i love um and yeah, but seriously and if it's a hand or you know on a shoulder or it's a you know whatever it might be i just think it is so important and i have absolutely missed it um you know from start to finish and so, as I say, looking forward to it. And, and for business, I think it's a massively important part, mm. you know. Um, I mean, my learn, all I'd say is that one of my learnings now is I think we've all become better at communication because of this, you know. Um, but equally, we've probably, I mean, I, for, I, for my, use me as a yardstick, I, I now um, am more conscious uh, about who, whom I'm talking to um, and for how long. One of the things that I found very early on was that because we weren't going into an office, I tried to cram in more meetings. So mm. I then got, I was up to sort of six or seven Zoom meetings a day and I had no time for follow-up and I was exhausted. Um, and I just think you have to be a little bit more particular on these sorts of things. Um, and um, and it's taught me certainly that not to, to speak with people, uh, or sorry, to speak with people a lot more who I want to speak to and to cut out a lot of, um conversations that i don't necessarily need to be in um or choose not to be in yeah perhaps you invest you you, you curate you spend more time creating who you're going to invest in and spend time with. but i think actually when we were talking um i i yesterday i had a zoom call with um someone in in sydney and uh, i've had quite a few zoom calls recently uh well as we all have and um the, I did have a connection with this guy. I thought he was a, he was doing some really great work and in business and in in and in his sort of impact kind of work. And we had and I felt that there was a definite connection. But you're right. He was in Sydney, so Zoom has opened and our learning over the last year has enabled that to happen. Which I don't think I even knew what Zoom was, you know, before the pandemic a year ago. But and and I could speak to him in Sydney, which you know I don't have to get on a flight, uh, you know, etc. But the deeper connection of you know building a trust and a relationship like you just really just you just picked up on about you know observing how they interact or you know with the shoes they wear or it's the sense of touch as well I, I as I'm a tactile person I, I can't give him a hug and I don't know perhaps you could elaborate a bit more in business how um the sense of actually having that in-person observation around you know their behavior and and whether that is possible to build up a deeper meaningful <sighs> trusting relationship quickly how quickly you can do that over zoom uh, yeah i mean i'm happy to elaborate i i, I really feel that long lasting or you know relationships with longevity business or otherwise um need to have that uh, interaction that physical physical interaction um and you know whether it be a coffee a lunch a meeting i think particularly in this sector particularly in uh, the the workplace well-being uh, through the lens of mental health that interaction that consistency of um interacting with uh, you know, someone who, who you have a relationship with, and that could be a, a boss, it can be someone who works for you, it can be a colleague, it can be um, the bus driver you see every day. Um, there's that sort of like continuum, if you like, um, of the things that are necessarily uniform. Some of our, some are uniform and, and some are, um, you know, per, per chance. But I just think that constant interaction, and I'm gonna to come back to it. For me, it's the senses. So whether it's touch, look, smell, hear, Without that, you are you're almost Android-like. Um, you know, you've just mentioned the word. None of us on this call know what our shoes are. So, Bonnie, <laughs> what shoes have you got on? I bet they're colourful. I don't have any on right now. I'm actually in my socks. <laughs> well, I've got my slippers on. <laughs> um, but I, but I, said, I genuinely mean that. So, depending on how people look, what they're you know what yeah. they you know what what they you know oh i oh that's a great cup of coffee or oh, can you smell those flowers or something happens to, oh i love that song do you those sorts of things keeps your mind going keeps your heart going spontaneity spontaneity but also also emotion so 
it's very hard to have emotion. We can laugh and we can make each other giggle, but mm -hmm. only through the sense of sight and hearing. Um, whereas in, in person, there's so much more is going on. And, and, and in, in the neuroscience, I'm sure, I'm no, I, I do not profess to be yeah, any- Yeah, heightened, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I just think that's the reason it's important. And in business, um, I, don't, I honestly would not do business with a supplier or a customer uh, for any length of time, honestly, unless I've met them, because I just think that's where loyalty comes in and, you know, you're there to fight for each other. I love the art of, you know, negotiating the final deal. For those of you who know me, you know, we'll, we'll, and, and that has to be done in person. You know, if I'm going to take that extra five pounds off you, I want to do it face to face and I want to buy you a coffee and, and you know, those sorts of things. And for me, it's, I, I really can't tell you how important from the belly of my gut, you know, I need to see people and hear people and in the right way, touch people uh, and smell people in those ways. In every sensorial way, it's important for me. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, so, Johnny, um, your background, you grew up probably as a young child with a, a bit of uh, perhaps a lack of a sort of human connection and you kind of had to find your own feet, really. How has that um has that increased your sense of value around actual human contact? And how has that gone on to shape how, the work you do now around mental health and, and, and mental fitness is what you, is a term that you, you, you like to use? Yeah, um, interesting question. We could, uh, <laughs> we could go, quite, uh, go quite deep, I guess, um, where to start. I mean, if I just take you back a little bit, just to give, um, I guess, uh, folk on a call a bit more context but when I was growing up I always felt a little bit different and um, when I was in the playroom at primary school I would get into fights with people and then I saw a psychologist report a number of years ago that said I was ever so slightly ahead of those people and therefore as a result for those kids in school I would just get frustrated and obviously now um, that's no longer the case but back then it was I mean being ahead of people <laughs> and mm -hmm. so so I never really that many mates um, and then when I was also quite young, I managed to acquire a scar in the middle of my forehead. Um, and I therefore Harry felt... <laughs> Say that again. Harry Potter scar. Well, Harry Potter, but no secret powers, very, very <laughs> sadly. And I always felt quite different. You can imagine you got negative comments, you were bullied a little bit. And because of those two things, I never quite fitted in. And I also came from a very small family, a working class family in Glasgow. And when I was 13, like many families up and down the country my parents got divorced but I ended up finding myself in a situation where effectively very shortly afterwards I very much felt like I was bringing myself up alone um, and you know a normal day for me would be doing a long walk to school coming back um, going to the supermarket trying to work out what to get for dinner do that do all the household chores do all the like you know, when I was 14, 15, I'd be phoning up, you know, organising house insurance, you know, like it just everything for the house. Your childhood I was, was rubbed a bit. Yeah, I would, yeah. And it was tough. So, and I guess because I never, and, and then my brother had moved out and my dad had found um, kind of a, a new lady and, and, and basically there was nobody really around. And we didn't have that many cousins or anything. And it was nobody's fault. It was just the way it was. And... For me, I, I was always quite fearful of having nothing. And therefore, for me, it was get your head down, try and get some type of job. One of my dad's mates was an accountant. I had no idea what an accountant was, but I just knew he had a house. And I thought, well, maybe that's like security. So I should do that. And then one thing led, you know, to the, to the next. And I am where I am today, but I feel very grateful um, for that. And also... You know, think about how can I therefore support the mental health agenda. And how are you? I mean, you you you've worked your way into various different corporate environments now. So, um, we were also talking about when I had, you know, I I was struggling with my own mental health and um at the BBC and um I I think we were we were talking before about. I didn't even know what um, EAP was or, you know, and I said I would never, I would never have phoned up a helpline or a number and to some random person and told them how desperate I was. But what I did have was um, a boss who was a human, 
he actually just saw that I was struggling, took me into the car park and just put his arm around me and just said, what, what's wrong? And I just burst into tears. And he was a dad and he was just a lovely guy. And he, his mum had had experience of mental health. So he kind of got it. And that is what I needed. I needed a human. So for someone who, you know, you spend a lot of time in the corporate world now, how do you manage or navigate um, getting some buy-in from the top and, and getting rid of these kind of gimmicks and actually just trying to educate people that sometimes we need to do is be a human? Yeah, and, and actually when you think about it, to your point, it's, it's actually quite simple. It's, you know, I think back to the 13-year-old boy that was sat there, very lonely, would question, you know, my, my place on this earth. And there was nobody around to say, let's talk. And that's actually, to your point, Laura, all it really needed was somebody there, but it's not something that was spoken about. And I think, therefore, in the business world, how do we talk about it? And to your point, tone from the top is really, really important. I remember in a previous life, I used to be the strategy director at Pladis. Pladis is a global snacking business that owns the likes of McBitty's Biscuits, uh, Godiva Chocolate. And... When I was there, we had just signed a pledge and the mental health pledge. And as you can imagine, I gravitated towards it and became the sponsor of the wellbeing program. And I remember going around the C-suite saying, you know, we should really do something on mental health. And every single time I said those words, mental health, I could just feel the stigma just, just mm -hmm. land on the floor. Like you'd see something and then, <clears throat> and these are people that just were not talking about mental health. And we had this amazing group of ambassadors, over 100 people, um, and we came up with a new program name called Positive Minds. And then I went back around the same people, the same C-suite, and said, I think we should do something with Positive Minds. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do a bit of Positive Minds. It's the same thing, <laughs> different language. Yeah. And I think if you can get language that resonates with people because of the stigma around mental health, then you can really get tone from the top. And I think that's just one part of it, to your point. There's loads of other stuff we could talk about, but I think that's an important part to really engage people with storytelling and language. Yeah, and as a, as a journalist and a storyteller, I, I absolutely would, would totally agree with that, that the way you deliver a message is then often how it's received. And the lang language is so interesting. And I think you, I could ask Simon a little bit about this because, you know, using the word mad, I remember having a conversation with Claire, who works with Simon about the event. And, and I think, they were, there were some conversations about why have you called it mad? <laughs> but perhaps, Simon, I mean, you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, one of our biggest objectives when we started this um, was to change the nar narrative and imagery around the word mental, mental health. Um, mental fitness, by the way, John, is one of our favourites, particularly with journalists, because they much prefer it. Although it's ridiculous, because as we all know this, here, we, you know, we all have mental health and it goes from thriving to striving and we've got to look after it our own and others around them so it, it's just i'm just as astonished now that when every human on the planet has had some form of um experience or bad experience with their mental fitness over the last 20 so the last 20 months if you like that we're still talking about stigma it, it just annoys me um but anyway we still are and it needs to you know there's no change unless we all change that's one of my well, the mottos of this of this particular uh, theme tomorrow um, and like all events, I see that Johnny's on the phone as well. So whether it be this can happen, whether it be your event that you're doing, um, I think where, when are you do, you're doing an event as the Speakers Collective soon, um, or any other event, you know, or my event or any others, it's about driving this home that, yes, yeah, storytelling is important, um, but eradicating the stigma uh, for me is is the key to it all. And I just think everyone has to be, it's very, it's, it's, I tell you an intro, I gave, had an interview the other day with, um, uh, Frank Bruno and about his his situation and, and I'm not dropping a name but it's really important these are words out of his mouth he said that he said you know mental health I said to him mental health is a bit like common sense it's empathy it's resilience empathy the attention to attention to prevention engagement um, and everyone getting you know mental health awareness for all um, and he turned and I said it's a bit like common sense and he turned around in his own words and I won't try and do his accent but he said yeah it oh, isn't I he said, it is a bit like common sense, Simon. Um, but he said, the problem with common sense is it's not that common. Um, yeah. And it was such a true, you know, such an accurate word, you know, to describe for me mental health at work. You know, if we all, you know, used our common sense, if we were all aware 
then those conversations, regardless of whether you call it mental fitness, positive minds or any other thing, it shouldn't make a bloody bit of difference. You know, you know, then we're all and we should. This is the time. This is the thing. This is the time when everyone has had, had their mental fitness affected in some way, shape or form. You know, as thousands, it's not one in four or one in, one in five. It's every single person. This is the time now to grasp it and say, look, we have all know it. So why do we have to feel like, like a, having a cold or breaking a limb? It will get better and we've got to look after it. And so, yeah, I think storytelling is great, buying from C-suite, but my single biggest thing, if you can change the imagery and narrative around that word mental health and make it positive, like dental health or physical health, um, then, you know, or dental, yeah, dental health is the one that lots of everyone use. You know, we're taught from the age of two to clean our teeth twice a day by whoever's looking after us, our parents, our guardian, whomever. Um, and if we could just do that with our minds, we'd be in a far better place. But do you think, so I'd like to ask both of you actually the same question, um, so we'll perhaps start with Johnny. Um, it's been going on for quite a while now because I did the campaign, that the Heads Together campaign came out um, and that's when I did an internal BBC campaign and that was years ago. And Simon, you've been doing these events for several years now, I've been involved in it several years, we, we all have. <laughs> do you think anything's changed? Because we're having the same conversation about come on we've got to get people to buy into it now do you think there is change real change or is it still talking about trying to change i'll jump in first johnny but yeah i've totally i 100 percent think there's been massive change leaps and leaps not enough mm. but there's been massive change massive acceptance uh, with success of any messaging also comes you know uh, a different set of issues so now we have a huge amount mm. of um vendor solutions that are perhaps not scientific backed or evidence proven um, which people have to navigate i think we've now got to get much more moving from uh, stigma to solutions mm -hmm. uh, to tracking how solutions are working you know the, the business case is proven everyone knows the business case about presenteeism absenteeism um, talent retention, leaveism, whatever you want to call it. There's no question that businesses now it's on their agenda. Now, thank God, goodness, mainly because of the future of work and, 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 and talent retention, um, it's still on the top table. But yet yeah, we have made change and we should celebrate that. I mean, there's no question we've made change, um, you know, it, it, but it's not systemic. It's been incremental sustainable incremental change but not systemic and if you don't mind i'm just going to put in one thing here which i wanted to get across today people now talking in business is all about um the environment and sustainable sustainability goals the esg goals yes that's very important now for businesses well there's a lady called tina woods who's working with the government at the moment she's going to be actually at the event tomorrow um uh, sort of in the tech talk so you, you should definitely come and um you know listen to her she's an amazing speaker and she's got something fabulous and basically she's trying to introduce h into the esg all right h being health and it, she's absolutely right if we have environmental sis, um, uh, sustainability and health as part of those uh, goals i think then we will look at making rather than incremental then we'll look at making hopefully in both those all three of those areas um looking at making systemic change uh, so that we don't go backwards ever yeah that's yeah esg but incorporating health for sure i just johnny you 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 say how you feel deep because i know that you've you've done a lot of education around um with companies around the investment and the you know the roi on, on investing in mental health yeah there's there's so much you've both said there's, there's, I, I want to respond to all go, of it go. <laughs> go. can i just pick up on one point a couple of points simon said is um i love that simon says what what you said was around the goals. The thing is, there is a UN Sustainable Development Goal, Goal 3, which is for good mental health for all. And I happen to uh, be part of a, a movement, which is the part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, Goalkeepers. And in there, we talk about Goal 3, which is um, good mental health for all. But the thing is, it's still too focused on physical and not enough on mental. Um, so there is something around how do we set goals, but even when the goals we have, make sure there's real parity with mental health. 
Um, but also at some point, do we need to legislate for organisations? Do we need to build it more into health and safety and the health goes back into health and safety? If you look at the great work that's been done recently, particularly around you know, gender pay gap, for example, and other equality measures and other areas around DNI, and i you know, what, what do we need to do um, to really get it on the agenda? But the thing is, you shouldn't it shouldn't have to be mandated mm. you know, this should come through organizations um small and large commercial or charitable whatever because it's the right thing to do we know that every 40 seconds somebody takes their own life and that's horrendous and how we know the moral arguments there and to your point the business cases there but i'm not sure though that all businesses still get the roi and still really want to, and organisations still, and even whether it's NHS, really want to continue to put their hand in their pocket in mental health space. Um, but I think there's so much you can do also, though, without investing a lot of money, and it's cultural. It's about creating the tone from the top. It's about, you know, having line managers that are also trained and aware. It's having, you know, ambassadors and having a grassroots initiative um, bubbling up. And I think if you can get the energy of those three things right, tone from the top, line managers, grassroots you can then start to create this environment to move forward and hopefully you can do that without necessarily the need for legislating for it yeah so, i mean do you think there's two points there do you think um there, there was a there was a fear when i started to share uh, there was a fear around people's career and you won't yeah you won't be promoted people think you're a bit flaky you might be a bit wobbly she's not reliable you know 100%. And you know those statistics that say that, you know, three quarters, more than three quarters of people will say that they recognise that work is a key determinant of the mental well-being. And if I just take accounting and finance professionals, again, in a, in a recent study, over three quarters said that they felt stressed at work. And actually, that is probably relatively, you know, a, probably a broad number anyway across society, different vocations and professions. Yet over 70, 80 percent of people will say they will not talk to their line manager through because they think it'll be career limiting. So take a step back. So we all know that work impacts mental health, folk are stressed, we won't talk about it because we think it's career limiting. That's what we then really have to break down. I think, you know, organizations and movements like this and Mad World and, you know, Mental Health Foundation and um, all these different organizations are so important in breaking that down so that we can talk about it because it shouldn't, in fact, you know, I was listening the other day to um, a podcast and they were talking about, would you not want actually to employ people that have had mental health issues because they're more resilient? And yeah. actually, you're, you're in a better position to be yeah. in. I was, I was about to say, um, uh, I think it was when, I don't know, a few years ago, we were, Forbes were here and I did an interview and then they, they we finished. And at the, at the end of the, the thing, um, he, we were off camera and and... Basically, they said to me, look, in your business, in exhibitions, you know, particularly at Showtime, it can be really quite intense. So be honest, you've just been talking about, you know, um, you know, if someone should talk about it and being open up and talking. But if someone, you know, actually was doing your employee and, and, and you know, had a, you know, couldn't handle a situation and they went off, but then they came back. The next time there was a situation, not necessarily, you know, maybe a high pressure situation, would you have put that, per you wouldn't put that person into that role? And I said, I thought about it, but I thought, no, you're absolutely wrong. The one person I'm going to put back in that role is the one that has been through it, was down on the floor, licking the cellar floor, went away, you know, came back stronger, more resilient, more aware of that situation. That's the person coming back in. So here for me, actually, you know, you know, talking about you know, your stress levels, is so, this is the problem. Again, it comes back to the narrative. It's not a weakness, it's a strength. If you tell people where, when your resilience is at its, at its maximum and you're given time to recuperate, and I'm not a doctor, but the scientific proof is, you look at the athletes, that look at um, the, the sprinters, they, they go under such pressure and strain in their job and they have to recuperate. They have their downtime. In fact, the sign of fitness is how quickly you go back to your, 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 your breathing levels, um, or I can't remember what they call it, your recovery stage, that's what they call it. So stress is not a bad thing, but you have to be given time to recuperate. And so I totally agree with Johnny that actually, 
the person you choose is the one that's been through the experience, bounced back, and that is a stronger person, not a weaker person. Amen, Amen yeah. to you, Simon. I 100% think I'm a better employer because of my journey through mental health. I'm a better, well, a, a definitely a better human, a de better friend, whatever, but also a much better and empathetic and self-aware employee, for sure, I would, I would um, employ. But I guess, I guess it's... Um, you know, coming back to sort of the human angle and, and things uh, and human connection. So do you feel like we have an opportunity now that we are coming back into, uh, you know, actually meeting in real life to to really accelerate this again? Because it's there's no doubt that mental ill health has, has suffered massively during the pandemic and being alone, etc. So I feel like it's now even more important and perhaps it's put it kind of a fresh perspective on the radar and now we have an opportunity, now we can come back together to, to go forward. Uh, for my part, I don't think there has been ever, ever been a better time for us to make systemic change on a global basis about everyone becoming more mentally health aware of themselves and, and of each other. I just don't think there ever has been a better time. So I, I urge everyone to, to play their role in that. And, and as I've said, my, my comment for this, these next um, you know, 48 hours with everyone I see is look, there's no change unless we all change and let's just do that. And I just, you know, for me, it's using the momentum of what we've all experienced with our mental fitness, um, you know, and uh, with our mental fitness, mental health, well, I'd love to keep calling it mental health because that's what it is. We've all had a bit, you know, everyone's had a wobble in some way, shape or form, whatever it might be, sadly, for those that have grieved, uh, have lost people. Um, but, you know, whether it be loneliness, stress, anxiety, anything, all the way through the whole spectrum, we've all, we surely we can be empathetic, both to ourselves and to others now. And yeah, the timing for me is absolutely paramount. And I, and I, I go as far as to say, if we let this opportunity go and don't use that momentum, then actually we, we all, we, then change doesn't deserve to happen, frankly. Yeah. Johnny? Yeah, I, 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 you've said so many uh, such really pertinent, uh, important points there, Simon. I think what, one thing that springs to mind as you're talking is how do we shift the narrative from illness to wellness? Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, you know, when you talk to, you know, I, I, I do work with different organisations, we talk about, what are you doing to try and, you know, support the mental health agenda or whatever you want to call it? And they'll say, you know, oh, well, I do a, an employee assistance program, you know, what, what you mentioned earlier on, Laura, or I do, um, you know, mental health first aiders. I'm like, but, but actually, you don't really do mental health, you do mental ill health. So mm -hmm. when do you do mental, positive mental health? And that's the thing, how do we shift it? How do we get more focus on prevention as opposed to just going, well, mental health is all about having first aiders and EAP, this crisis. There is definitely a role for that. It's really important. But it's part of the wider systemic cultural piece and the wider tools that, that you need to have in place. And I think with, you know, you mentioned it there around, you know, depression, anxiety, loneliness. You know, since the onset of the pandemic, I think the, the first study that the Mental Health Foundation did, um, loneliness went from something like 10% to 25%. So it's like doubled and other rates, you know, anxiety, et cetera, were all massive. At some point, that's got to cycle back into society. Where's it going to cycle back into? It will cycle back into business. So therefore, businesses and organizations that are better prepared to have that as people start, you know, coming out of the houses and start getting a public transport, start going back into the office, who is going to be better prepared? And I think those organizations that are better prepared will also be the ones that will perform better and also attract and retain the best talent. Yeah, and also just um, when we're talking about, you know, my emotionally constipated <laughs> phrase, we were talking, when we were talking, Johnny, before um, before we came on, it was, um, I sort of suggested that some people feel, or said to me, they didn't know what to say, so they avoided saying it. And, and actually, I think for managers and line managers, that can be quite a difficult challenge to know how to approach someone who they think is suffering. Because and, and I always say, you know, even sometimes my family didn't know what to say to me. And I always said, I just I, I couldn't give you a script. I didn't need to really say anything. I just wanted to be heard or to listen or just someone to put their arm around me and say, so, say it was OK. Um, and so I think if, if there's anything we can try and do and educate, you know, people in the workplace or managers or people, it's actually 
don't worry, you're not going to make it any worse. Just be a human. It's like, I can't, I can never go on about that enough and what it it's means. Just- but I think there's sometimes fear around, you know, your manager or leaders is to know what to say or how to, to do it. I think no. Well, yeah, no but, Simon. yeah, just one thing. I just could you, the Samaritans, uh, arguably the very, very best people to go to if you have to, um, or if you need to, or if you want to. Um, and they have a very, very simple, um, and I'm, not, I'm probably going to get it wrong, and I don't want anyone to, 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 to you know, if I get this wrong, I apologise. But there, there's three things they say, which is be kind, be patient, and the most of all, be quiet. Mm. So you know, when someone wants to, to talk to you, they don't, they're not looking. I mean, certainly if anyone talks to me, the, the best thing I might do is signpost them, but I'm certainly not going to do anything else. I'm just going to listen um, and be empathetic and, and put that arm around you metaphorically or physically. Um, and, 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 you know, the Samaritans are the very, very best. And, you know, you know, what we should all take a leaf out of their book, whether you're talking with a colleague, an employee, an employer, your manager or anyone in your family. Yeah, I think, and, and, and to your point, it's not, it's not rocket science that has been there to talk, but some people just find it awkward. Mm. You know, I would probably, a number of years ago, find it awkward if somebody wanted to talk to me about the, the mental health or, you know, get into more emotional subjects. But, um, and people will find it awkward, but I guess the more we talk about it, the more we role model it. Role modeling is so important. We need to see more role models in business and more line managers role modeling these types of um, conversations. Um, and you know that's why some of the best campaigns out there are the simplest ones. You know, let's talk. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so some of Vitti's in mind was about let's talk, um, or look at us twice, or how are you? How are you really? And is actually not that difficult, but it's finding a space to do it. And I, I remember um, years ago I had to give this um, talk um, for chartered accountants. Um, and I was really nervous about it. I had to stand up and basically it was at the admission ceremony and I hate, I'm somebody who's quite introverted. So I don't really like, you know, presenting or talking, uh, you know, big groups. And I was so nervous about this. And I had to stand up, give this talk. And I thought I'm going to talk about mental health. And like I say, to, to your point, you know, Laura, accountants are not exactly known about talking about emotional subjects. I thought I'm just going to go and do it. So I spoke about it. And I came off and the amount of people that came up to me afterwards and said, just even saying the words and talking about it was so important. And, you know, just to coin Jeff McDonald, a great guy, you know, he will often say, you know, we're here to storytelling and we're here to send lifeboats for every story that we tell. Right. And, and I think that's so important because back to storytelling and talking and listening. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I just want to just, you know, there's, there was, um, a couple of things people are saying. I just want to see, does anyone, would anyone like, just for looking at the time, would anyone like to join in who's, who's listening from outside of here? Has anyone got anything they would like to contribute? I know Matt's had to run off, but Penny or Ben, or I think we've got Peter there. He's always a joy to see. Dan, feel free to to. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, I've just been sitting here the whole time nodding and agreeing. I think um, there's so many great, you know, conversation points. And, um, you know, just going back to what we were chatting about at the start, I just can't wait for tomorrow. I think we're all going to come away pretty exhausted on Friday, um, you know, with a really immersive day actually in person all together at the Mad World Summit. I think it's going to be beautiful. And, yeah, I just uh, agree with everything everything you just said. I really liked what you said, actually, uh, Simon, around uh, stigma to solutions and, you know, the measuring the impact piece i think that is going to be fascinating over the next 12 months because um you know i think we i think we've all done the best we can with our webcams and i've got a beautiful relationship with with my (laughs) glorious webcam in front of me as best as we can but um yeah you know measuring our impacts over the next 12 months now i think is going to be high on the list because um you know i think so many organizations feel like they should be doing more and capitalizing on this beautiful wave that we've got in front of us and you know an in-person conference last week said that they're going to be doing um, a sense check a post-covid sense check as an industry looking ahead to 2022 but we've all got this as an opportunity for ourselves as well to address how we're all doing as individuals um but it is beautiful timing now to strategize and look at the next you know one two three four years uh, about measuring that impact now because it's not you know mental health should never be an afterthought it's right on the agenda roll on tomorrow um but yeah i've just been uh, sitting here nodding and agreeing with everything so yeah really great session thank you so much
Well, thank, thanks, Dan, so much. And it just it's just interesting. As we, as so many of us are going to be seeing each other tomorrow. I've had to actually, um, I've done a story around this actually about social anxiety. Now, how, how, how are we going to meet each other? I'm obviously going to give you a hug if you're okay with it. But I now have to think about that. Some people, you know, I went to somewhere the other day and they, they didn't, they didn't even want to shake my hand. They just did like, you know, the punch thing still. So there's this whole now idea around how do we go back into that kind of human connection relationship and what is appropriate for some person for somebody might not be appropriate for the others so i think that'd be really well, for interesting my, for my part i'm going to be kissing everybody so <laughs> if you don't want when i when i walk towards you if you don't want to kiss just go like that okay <laughs> <laughs> that goes for you peter johnny everyone okay dan everyone you know what i mean i'm going straight in <laughs> straight in with <laughs> So can I ask a quick question? question? Yeah, put your hand up. I have a question. I never quite know whether to do that raised hand or just literally put your own hand up. Um, no, definitely up for hugs. So, uh, okay. but only if appropriate. So like you say, if you go for a kiss, I may back off. But um, <laughs> I wanted to ask in the context of needing to see what comes out in the next kind of six to 12 months, do we actually know of any bodies that are collecting current statistics because statistics for me are still 2014 2016 and like i i don't know people keep on saying that statistics will be updated but i'm just wondering do any of you know of anyone who is collating current statistics around what specifically well around kind of the impact that mental health and this pandemic is having well, on people the Office for National Statistics do, because I've done a lot of work with the BBC, they continue, continuously look at things. And there are think tanks that are, but, um, and the government do collate them. But, you know, it's also, it's very hard. It's the same, you know, we always tried when we looked at eating disorders, you know, we always tried to see how many people had eating disorders. But, the, but half the problem is so many people don't report it. I so, say, you know, mental health isn't always reported because of the stigma still. So they're never massively accurate. And I think they're always a lot less than the actual reality. Peter, I think it's such a, an important point, and particularly in business, you're always looking for evidence points as well to try and either you know, justify or drive future behaviour. But you, it might be worth, if you haven't already seen it, some of the good work by the Mental Health Foundation. They have done 11 waves of research showing some of the rates of mental illness and also particularly around inequalities, which of course was the um, the main subject of World Mental Health Day, but and also around more diversity and inclusion as well and disadvantaged groups. So it's worthwhile uh, taking a, a deeper dive into some of that. And uh, um, Johnny's also just put in the chat, um, Peter, that Centre for Mental Health are always doing research. But it's a really good, it's a really good point. And I think it is, if there was some way of having a tracker or an impact measurement, I mean, yeah. Just uh, as an aside there, so. Um, one of the things we normally do each year, um, and not us exclusively, uh, but business in the community normally do a, a workplace wellbeing report, starting at the very first one they did with the Stevenson Farmer report. Um, and, you know, Mind worked with them and they do it, they've done it each year, but they're not doing it this year. Um, but there are others. So um, there are announcements by um, one of our fantastic corporate partners about what they do in uh, for mental health in the workplace which is ASIC so they're doing a, a press breakfast with an announcement of lots of research which they've called movement of the mind or mm -hmm. movement for the mind which would be interesting another, there's another company called Pam Wellbeing who's done a lot of research which they're doing an announcement tomorrow that they, they're going to share with everyone um, so hopefully there'll be some research um, although they will be more I think they'll be you know they'll be more subjective to that company doing it but I do think you're right. I think for me, the biggest thing is if I, I have a, not even an SME, I have a, you know, a small company, but if I want to spend, let's say 30,000 or 50,000 pounds a year on the well-being of my team, I want to be damn sure that every single pound is being spent effectively for that team. And I think the tracking, uh, the evidence base and the tracking of 
the vendor solution providers is massively important because anyone coming here to procure something, no matter what it is, as we all know, it's far from binary, but I, whatever they choose to do and whatever solution they put in, I want it to work. Um, and I do think there has to be some form of, um, I don't know, overarching, um, you know, like an, maybe like an ombudsman where people can share what's really worked in their organizations, what has made significant impact, um, and also equally what's been a complete waste of time and what's been shit, frankly, and, and don't do it again and save people. I think that one of the th things that in, in the construction industry, one of the very first facts I learned um, uh, five years ago when I got into this was that in the construction industry, when there's a death on site, um, everyone has to report that fatality to somewhere. And that's to help um, building sites, no matter what company, to, to be more safer. Um, horrible, horrible statistic at the end of that story. Um, but the, before that, the good news was that, you know, deaths, fatalities on building sites went down dramatically dramatically um, as soon as this ombudsman started happening it went down dramatically something like there were three deaths uh, in that one year from all construction sites um, all over the UK mm. conversely and this is the horrible fact and it was five years ago in the same time period in the same construction sites there were 300 suicides so when you know, which was just horrific was one of the massive reasons I got involved in it. I just couldn't believe that that you know, that, that's a huge difference between, uh, if you like, safety, which was making leaps and bounds. And you looked at health and safety. Safety was doing great, but health, particularly mental health, uh, was, was, was not catching up. And um, so I love the idea of sharing that information, which companies are doing, mm. particularly the banks that I'm working with. This is what works. This is what doesn't work. In fact, I'm more, I think it's more important for people to sit, sit stand up and say, for goodness sake, don't do that, you know, because it hasn't worked for us. Thanks, Simon. Well, look, I didn't realize, I mean, it's just incredible. We managed to do a whole, uh, almost an hour of, of, and I haven't even gone through all my questions, but I knew that would happen with you two lovely chaps. So I'm going to try and um, ask you to sum up um, the value of human connection to you in one word, and that's one word, Simon. <laughs> Is Simon the word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are, the, you are the total value of human connection. That's a good one. Um, the, 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 for me, it would be um, uh, empathy, um, which uh, it has a thousand words underneath that banner. But if we can all be empathetic to each other uh, and to ourselves, then we really, really will live in a better place. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And Johnny? You know, I'm just seeing uh, Johnny Benjamin, the great Johnny Benjamin on the uh, on the line. Johnny. So nice <laughs> to see you. And the word that is uh, coming to my mind is hope. And obviously that is the name of uh, Johnny Benjamin's uh, Book of Hope. But I think something about connection just gives me hope, gives me hope for the future, optimism for the future. And I think I just link the two because connection keeps keeps you going. And it's such a wonderful thing, just, just like hope. Yeah, a hundred percent. And um, yeah, I'm incre I'm just incredibly grateful to have been asked to do this and to have um, all of your lovely faces. And it's been such an inspiring, insightful um, chat. And uh, so much. I love these kind of conversations because I try not to script as much. I just like to just you know go go with it. And it's so much has come out of it. Um, so yeah, just to you know, for I think jo Johnny's it's a privilege to have him here walking with his walking in it looks like London in a wet London but um yeah the speakers because so we've got mad world tomorrow so we're going to see many of you there and um can't wait to have have real life hugs and then the um the speakers collective we've also got our real life um in-person event on the 11th of November in Birmingham so um we will put all those links to that as well at the end it's um hopeconference.co.uk and uh, madworldsummit.com for tomorrow so thank you so much for all being awesome guests and participants it's been really lovely to have you all here and um look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow thanks laura thank bye. you laura simon everybody great to see you take care bye, bye now yeah bye thanks everyone that was brilliant